All right. Well, good morning, everyone. I can't believe we're here. This is the last sermon of the series, um, and we're finally finishing verse 13. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Matthew 6, and we're just going to look at verse 13 there. And it's, uh, I'm kind of sad in a way that we're, we're done with this because it's just been so sweet. I mean, I've gotten text messages throughout the week over the last eight weeks now um, that just so many people are, are just full of joy because they've gotten, again, just this understanding of prayer and gotten to see their prayers being answered. Um, and there has just been a whole lot of that, whether it's life group or people just randomly texting and just saying, hey, thank you for this message. Thank you for this series. It's just been, it's been incredible. And, you know, the first thing we said, and I've, I've written it on every, um, every week on the notes, just that we would be a joyful praying church, um, that this would not be a chore. This would not be a duty. This would be a delight. This would be something that when we see when we read in the Psalms, when we read about David and his journal as he was writing in his journals. I mean, that's his journal. If you're wondering what to write, you know, uh, I'm actually taking my kids right now, the younger ones, through, uh, it's called, it's, it's a children's story called Wonderful. And it's, it's just uh, how to find uh, God or joy in the, in the Psalms. It's just going through every Psalm. And it, it's pretty simple. I mean, it, a lot of them just, you read a Psalm and then it said, you know, come up with your own song because basically that's what that is. It's, it's David's journal. It's the psalmist's journal. And just uh, sharing your heart with God uh, and, and whatever it might be, whether it's supplication or whether it's praise and adoration or whether it's just a, an ask to, for God to continue to sanctify and make you more holy. And um, We read Psalm 51 last week, Psalm 32, incredible passages when you find yourself in sin. Uh, just a, it's a go-to passage. They're there, they're written for your, I mean, for your instruction. Second Timothy 3 says that, that the, the, the word of God is inspired and it's written for your instruction. It's written for, to train you in righteousness, to, uh, to, to bring you back to holiness uh, and realizing that sanctification is a process. And we'll talk about that more towards the end. But let's, let's, our, let's go ahead and look at the last line of the Lord's prayer. Uh, remember this whole thing started with uh, the disciples having a humble heart. Remember that? I mean, they had humility. They just went to the Lord and said, and we could do that right now. I mean, I know some of you guys are new and especially if you're, you're new uh, because you just came to college this week, um, just know that uh, you could go back and listen to the messages online and, and catch up and that's fine. But we started off with this understanding that we all don't know how to pray, just like the disciples didn't know how to pray. And that's one of the most humble things you can do and admit is just say, Lord, I... Would you again teach me how to pray? I mean, does anyone think maybe even it could be possible in the next three months that you just go back to the Lord and say, teach me how to pray? What do you think the enemy is going to tell you? Well, you just learned about that. You should know how to pray by now. What's wrong with you? But realizing this is an ongoing pursuit to learn how to pray, to continue to humble yourself and say, we don't know what we're doing. Would you teach us how to pray? And he would be delighted to do that all over again whether you go back to the sermon series or, or read books about it or just simply go back to Matthew 6 and take out, an out, take out a piece of paper and write an outline and fill in uh, about three lines per, per line in this prayer and just say, Lord, teach me again how to pray and so that I can be close to you and be filled with joy and give that away to other people. And so verse 13, uh, this, is, this is now uh, asking for spiritual help. He's, a, he's asking, the, the, he, Jesus is, is telling his disciples and saying, uh, pray like this, do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us from evil. That's not, it's very much the same passage, but we're gonna, we're gonna go through about eight, eight points and they'll be brief, but just uh, kind of unpacking this one line uh, of verse 13 and I, I want to just start off with one, the, a question. What are the devil's goal? Do you know the, the devil's goal for, uh, for temptation? What is the devil's goal? What does the Bible say about Satan? A lot, I, I can't tell you how many times uh, the last couple of weeks I've been warning people, hey, do you realize you're in a battle? Do you understand that you are in a spiritual battle right now? And what does that look like for you? It looks different for everybody. But the, the goal of Satan, the goal of the enemy with temptation is to destroy you. And we need to know that. That is the vision of, of why, he takes, why he tempts us. It's ultimately to destroy us. What is, where we get that from is John 10.10. 10, the, the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. 
1 Peter 5, 8, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking to what? To devour you. That is his goal. And even as you come into college, you will have, even as a Christian, if you're a Christian and you came from Tampa or Jacksonville or you came from Miami or we're out, maybe even out of state, and you're like, hey, my parents are like, the first thing they told me is find a church. Or maybe perhaps, you know, you just, you got a flyer from us and you're just curious and you're like, hey, I, I, I had a great conversation with somebody and someone invited me to church. Whatever it might be, the reality is you are in a battle whether you realize it or not. If you call yourself a Christian, if you're a follower of Christ, you have a big target on your back and you, are, you, you have this enemy who has come to destroy you and he will tempt you for that purpose. In Ephesians 10, or I'm sorry, Ephesians 6, 10 through 20, it shows that battle. It shows the, the, the armor that we need to put on every day to withstand the fiery darts of the enemy. And then in Matthew 4, Jesus models what it looks like to actually fight the enemy using the word of God. And we don't have time to unpack that necessarily now, but just understand that uh, even the Puritans, as I've been studying this whole, uh, I, I, as I'm studying this passage, I'm, I'm studying, you know, the, what the commentaries say and, the, and, and, and all that. But really, I was curious, what do the Puritans say about the Lord's Prayer? There's just so much on it. And one of the Puritans says this, there is no temptation. I mean, the enemy does come against us and, and, and we, we cannot blame the enemy for our own sin when we finally give into it. But he does say this, that there is no temptation that is more dangerous than what springs up from within the heart. And don't forget that it actually starts in the heart. I mean, James says that, right? It actually begins in the mind. And if we're not careful, it's just so easy to let that thing just dwell there. It's the LSD of the Bible, right? I mean, it starts with, it starts with lust and then, and then it ultimately leads to sin and then death. And so that's what James 1 is trying to communicate. It's dangerous stuff. You cannot just say, it's just a thought. How many of you know? How many of you guys know that it just starts with a thought and you're like, hey, it's not a big deal, it's just a thought. And all of a sudden you look back, you're like, what in the world? That was just a thought. But that's where it starts. And he's saying that there's, I mean, the enemy might have something to do with that, and he does. But the reality is, it begins in your heart. It's your flesh. He plays on your flesh. You give him a lot of playing material. You give him a lot of material to, to use on a daily basis. The temptation may not lead to full action in the moment, he says, but it will certainly weaken the believer and pollute the soul. Every time that you let a thought, every minute or every second that goes by that you let that thought remain there, it weakens you and weakens you and weakens you. To the point that you just say, you, sur you surrender, you give in. Whatever, that might, whatever sin it might be, he doesn't specify what sin that is. I think we all know if we, if we, if we, you know, if we just took like three seconds, think about the sin that, you entangle, that entangles you that Hebrews 12 talks about. I think we'd all label that. And then on top of that, we're all deceived in some area that we don't know about. And it takes an act of God, actually really an act of grace to reveal that. And sometimes it's actually one of your peers that points that out to you. But don't let it remain in your mind because it eventually does turn into sin and then ultimately leads to death and destruction, which is the enemy's plan. So what's God's plan? What's his intention with trials? Because this word temptation here actually means trial. So are we supposed to pray, pray away trials? We'll get there in a moment. No. But what are God's intentions for the trial? What is, it's temptation is neutral in that sense. It could be used for good or it could be used for evil depending on who's playing on it. And so what James is saying, James 1, 2 through 4, it says, consider it joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. And that word various means it's suited for you. It's very specific. It's, it's actually, it, the trial that somebody else is going to, it wouldn't work for you. That's why sometimes when you see somebody going through something, you might be like, well, I don't, I don't, I don't know why that's a battle. That's, that's easy. Well, because it's easy for you. But when the Lord takes us through something or allows the enemy to tempt us, he's using that for a purpose. And it says that right here, it's the testing of your faith. It's the testing of your faith so that it produces endurance so you become stronger. And then ultimately, I love this, you lack nothing, but he says that that endurance will eventually 
have its perfect result so that you might be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. I would imagine if we took a survey around here, do you want to lack anything? I mean, do, do you want to have lack in your Christian walk? No, none of us would. But equally, we'd say, well, I don't necessarily think we want to go through a trial in order to get there. So all of us are avoiding that. There is a God in this world. Do you know what that is? Self-preservation. To love yourself more than you love the work of God in your life. That is, is in, it's, it's, it's here. It's, it, 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 don't be fooled by that. I mean, 2 Timothy says, I, I was telling the leaders yesterday, there's 165 volunteers in this church. Look around the room. It's basically the entire church. 80% of the church are volunteering. It's amazing. So it was my privilege to, to talk to them yesterday. And, we, and, we, and we, we talked about some of these things. But one of the things we talked about in 2 Timothy 3 is that don't be a lover of yourself. Because that is the spirit of the age today. The spirit of the age is to love yourself. And you can see that everywhere, right? I mean, you can see that in abortion, right? It's because love yourself. I mean, that's why we kill babies ultimately is because you love yourself. Clear, clearly don't love other people. I mean, and we could just keep going down the line. I mean, it, it's just the reason why you don't discipline your kid as a parent is because you, do, you, you, you love yourself. You don't really have time. You love your time. You love, you love yourself. You love your life. You just don't want to be inconvenienced by anything. The reason why we don't serve is because we love ourselves. The reason why we sin, the reason why we give into sin on a daily basis is because we ultimately love ourselves more than we love God. I mean, he says, if you love me, then you, love, then you will do what I say, right? I mean, it's, it's pretty simple, but he, we realize that, okay, I don't want to lack anything in my life, so Lord, take me through trial. It's a very daring thing. One thing I really found out about this is that whether you pray it or not, God's going to take you through trial because he loves you a lot. <laughs> so so it's, it's just the way it is, you know? So you can't even, you can't like manipulate God, you know? And, and you can't just be like, oh, I'm just not going to pray anything. I'm just going to see what happens, take my chances. No, you'll go through trials. But you'll, you'll go through them. And this, this prayer does not mean praying against trial. It does not mean avoiding trial. I have prayed so many prayers in my life, it's almost embarrassing. And if I, if I look back at them, it's praying against the trial or praying me out of a trial quickly. But what this prayer is actually saying, and it's pretty profound when you think about it, when you understand the big vision, when you understand why God's actually taking us through this and wants to take us through this and it's for our good, it's pretty profound in that Jesus is asking all of us to pray this prayer and saying, you're going to go through, it's not an, a matter of if you'll go through a trial, it's a matter of when. And so when you're in trial, he's saying, please don't let me give into the world. Don't let me take a shortcut. I mean, it's, it's, it's what Jesus went through, right? When he was going through the, the temptation in the desert, if you remember, right? The enemy was ultimately doing one thing. He was trying to get him to take a shortcut to glory. That would actually not be good for anybody in the room at this point. Because there'd be no salvation. He would actually get his glory in the moment when he'd jump off the cliff. Angels would swoop by and be like, wow, this guy's amazing. But in that he would have lost everything because he would have given in to the enemy. And, and the enemy's like, oh, I'll give you the keys to everything. You know, I know you want that. He's like, there's only one way I'll get the keys. And that's through death. That's through suffering, trial, because in the end, not only will I be victorious, but everyone who follows me. And so the only way, I mean, we talked about this right, right through the, the gospel of Mark. I mean, we just hit this every week towards the end, didn't we? But I love this. It's, it's so good. I mean, Matthew 5, let me just read a few passages to help us understand that trials will come. And I think we just need to embrace that and accept that because once we do, then we can actually get down to business with this prayer. And we will be at peace and we will see victory. Matthew 5, 11 through 12 says, blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you. So we know that trials can come through a form of persecution, people insulting you, all those things, or a thorn in the flesh like Paul, 2 Corinthians 12, and they save all false, uh, false things against you and evil because of me, because of being a follower of Christ. Rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great. So have perspective, knowing that there's not gonna be a trial in heaven. So you have that perspective. 2 Timothy 3.12, all who desire, listen to this, all who desire to live a godly life. In other words, you can't godly your way out of a trial. 
You think that we can earn our way out. Okay, I'll be on my best behavior. I'll never have to go through a trial again. Actually, <laughs> when you think about it, if you don't do that, you'll go under a trial and it's called God's discipline. So if you are godly, you'll go under this thing called a trial and it'll actually perfect you even more. So you're screwed no matter what. <laughs> in the most godly sense. <laughs> and I mean that in a, in a good way, right? But it, it, you just, you feel that. And it's like, we are, we are so, in America, we're so in a self-preservation. We are trying to preserve ourselves from any bit of pain. And we realize pain actually allows us to lack nothing in the end. It's a good thing. It's really good. I don't like it. Nobody likes it. But we love the result, don't we? How many, I don't know if you ever do this. I'm like, you know, like you're, you're thinking, you're like, I just want to take a survey right now, like a, an assessment of where my life is. Am I in the valley? Am I getting out? Or am I going down in? You know, it's one of the three. And I'm going to tell you, like, being on the top doesn't last long. That's probably the, it doesn't, it's like three seconds. And then you, you're starting to walk back down. <laughs> if you ever read Pilgrim's Progress, you, you understand what I'm talking about. Going down. But then once you're in there, and then you're starting to go back up, you're like, okay. All right, this, I know it's the last three seconds, but and then we'll go back down again. It's just the way it goes. That's why a lot of people don't want to follow Jesus. why a lot of people come to church maybe for two or three weeks, and then they leave. They're just the soil that once the sun hits the, the roots, um, they realize they're on rocky soil and they don't last. Because it says that when persecution hits, they don't really want anything to do with that. And so Psalm 3, also if you want to look there in the Old Testament, if you want to just look there quickly to Psalm 3, it shows again just the how when the adversaries were increasing for David and many are rising up against him, there's, there's no deliverance from him in God, but you, O oh Lord, are a shield about me. They're saying all these things that God's not gonna come through for you or whatever, but he finds God to be a shield. He finds him to be the answer. He answered me from the holy mountain. He says he lays down and sleeps and then he awakes for the Lord sustains him. He can be at peace in any circumstance because he understands that God is allowing these things to happen for his good. It's classic Romans 8, 28. He, allow, he, he does all things for our good. So why avoid evil? David is not necessarily trying to avoid evil. I mean, he's asking God, arise, O Lord, and save me. I mean, we are to pray these things because he's asking, he's saying, he's not saying, uh, like, I want to avoid this trial, those things. He's like, I don't want to bring about more suffering because I've given into the world, my flesh, or the devil, or lies. And you see that that's, that's the biggest part of this. I mean, we're not to pray to avoid this trial. We're to avoid the evil in the trial. The evil that comes, the evil that, that there are, it, it's so easy that, you know, when you're in a trial, it is, your, your flesh is more susceptible to this desire for comfort, instant comfort, instant gratification, normally is in those times. And it's so easy, but then you're going to prolong that trial because it's, it, you're going to bring about the discipline of God also equally that God is trying to perfect your faith at the same time. It gets ugly, doesn't it? It gets more complex. And then people, your peers from the outside are, are just like all trying to give you, it's like Job's friends are just trying to give you all this advice and you're like, you don't understand. I got this, I got a lot going on. <laughs> we complicate the trials so much and Jesus understands it. So he's like, hey, let me just help you out here. When you go through trial, pray, Lord, please, I do not want to give in to my flesh. I do not want to give in to this evil around me. I do not want to give in to the world's comforts. Help me. It's not a prosperity gospel prayer, Lord. Just help. I pray that everything just works out in my life and it works out beautifully. I know you can do that. Of course he can do that. He doesn't want to do that. <laughs> okay. That was uh, number three, if you were paying attention. Um, this is number four now. <laughs> you can ask for my notes uh, from Jessica Frankie. Yeah. So don't just ask God to protect you. So the first one was, what are the devil's goals? Second one is, what are God's goals? Third one is, what does this prayer not mean? Fourth one is, don't just ask God to protect you, but ask him to give you a heart to obey. Be offensive 
in your attacks, not just defensive, right? That prayer doesn't necessarily say that, but it is implicit in the passage, right? It's like saying, okay, I want to avoid all evil, but God, give me actually a desire to love you and to obey and to actually to fall in love with you. And I just don't even have a desire for those things anymore. Did you ever pray something like that? You don't have to just be defensive in your walk with God. You could be offensive, take ground. It says here that Matthew 5 eight, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. You know, that. have you ever just like, you just, um, you just said some really nasty things to your spouse, you yelled at her or whatever, or you looked at something really stupid on the internet and you just gave in to sin you, you've given to thoughts in your li- in your in, in you, you've lied, you've cheated people, and then you eventually go to a life group and you feel the shame. You feel you feel like I don't belong here. You feel like I've missed out because I'm in sin now, and that sin is robbing me of the purity of God, and his, and, and the purity of God has to do with His people. It's like you get to see his people in a whole new light. So when you give in to sin, you're like, I just want to avoid that. I want to avoid that. You're missing the point that I want to go and I want to actually pray for people and love people and see the beauty of God and see like the, the just even like if you even go to something uh, like w- whether it's the Grand Canyon or whether it's Yosemite or whatever it is, that if you're, if you're allowing your mind to be corrupted, you can't see the beauty around you. It blinds you. And the only way that you'll be able to actually see the beauty of God is to be pure in heart. So what, pray that. Pray that. Pray that daily. Not just I want to avoid, but oh, I want to see, I want to be motivated. It's a greater motivation. The greater motivation is not just the avoidance of getting caught. Such a cheap motivation. The avoidance is not the greatest. Receiving, avoiding, just even receiving God's discipline is not the greatest motivation. The greatest motivation is to see God, to actually enjoy him fully. And we are robbed every time we give in, every time, no matter what it is, fill in the blank. Number five, this petition also doesn't exempt you from guarding against temptation. In other words, you can't, you cannot just pray this prayer and be lazy. Oh Lord, I just pray that I avoid, I pray that I avoid, I pray that. And not actually be disciplined to protect your heart, Proverbs 4.23. To be disciplined and watch your eyes, Job 31.1. To be disciplined and close your ears towards sin and gossip and slander, Ecclesiastes 7.21 and 1 Corinthians 15.33. And then tame your tongue from Psalm 39.1 and 141.3. Joel, you could go ahead and put those up there. I'm just, for the, for the sake of everybody's sanity. Because those are good. I, I, I want you to, to understand that you can't just pray this prayer and do no work. Now, is the work in your own strength? Of course not. But you actually have to do, you have to, have to get up and fill your mind with the word of God. It, it takes somewhat of a muscle to open up the Bible. Small, I mean, you don't have to be jacked up to do that. But just, you know, opening up and, and turning this little page, you, you do actually have to get up out of bed and do something and get the word inside of you. To start your day off right with him so that you can, pl- so you can live offensively. You, you, you can protect your heart. How do you protect your heart? How does a young man stay pure? By living according to his word, right? Psalm 119. Number six, this is a corporate prayer. This strengthens our church. I just got a text message just recently, I think this week, from, from one, of my, um, one of my good friends in the church. I mean, he just... He just said, he just randomly texted me. I was like, what is this for? He said, he said, praying for your joy to abound in obedience to the Lord. I was like, is this like some prophet, you know? And um, I just, I actually asked. I was like, you know, I mean, why did you text me that? I mean, did you have any reason to text me? It was just randomly or? He's like, no, I actually needed it in my own life. And so I thought not only would I pray for myself, but I pray for you. That's what we're supposed to do. It's, it's, it, let me go back to, I mean, do not lead us. He's talking about the church, us. So we're praying that, is that, do not lead me into temptation, but lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. It's a corporate prayer. It's just really, it's really easy, guys. I mean, when, when and, I, and I'm constantly being reminded of this, but when I'm praying for something that's, something is aching me, something is, is disturbing me, and I'm praying, I'm asking God for something, I'm like, also, I, I'm remembering, oh, these, there's a lot of other dudes that need this prayer as well. 
There's a lot of other people that need this as well. And it's just so easy to do that. Can you imagine the prayers that are being answered when, when you, when, I mean, we're just like, if you could see like this aerial view of like all this like cross praying and just, I mean, it's not just like this individual thing, but God's just answering all this prayer. It's absolutely amazing. And, and, and like I said, we'll have all of eternity to find out all the victories and all the things that have happened and people praying for one another. It's actually just incredible. That's why, that's why it's called eternity. I mean, just, there's so much to learn. There's never a dull moment. Number seven, why do we need to pray this prayer of protection? It's pretty obvious that temptation pulls you away from God. It discourages you. It makes you feel abandoned. It makes you feel, uh, you know, just you're constantly messing up and, and shame and, and guilt. And it just this cycle, endless cycle. I mean, I've talked to so many people. I mean, just I'm, they're so sick of the cycles. They're so sick of it. They're so tired of it. John 17, 15 says, Jesus, he, you know, he prays that we would not be taken out of the world, right? Because we can't be taken out of the world. I mean, he can. He can kill us and take us out of the world. But, but, but he's not going to take us out. He's not going to put us in like some sort of like... Um, you know, like some people live in, in just an isolation or something. No, we're to live in the world, in the midst of the world, like in your workplace with a lot of unbelievers. We are to live around uh, and bombarded by all this temptation. But, but we are be, he's praying that we be kept from the evil one. From, from evil, we're in the world, we're not of the world. We're not, we're not to be of it. We're not to be loving the world and the things of this world. Self-preservation, lovers of self, etc. cetera. As long as we're alive, we're going to be under constant assault. And I just want to ask you, are you honestly aware of the battle that you're actually in? Do you understand what you signed up for? I mean, I learned early on what I signed up for as a believer at 18 years old when I got saved. It's like, this thing's a battle. And it never ends. But Jesus has given us so much victory through his word his promises, he says this in 2 Thessalonians 3.3, 3, the Lord is faithful. He will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. What, all, what other promise do you need? That is incredible. Romans 8, 37, 39, you know, demons can't destroy the believer. No one can, nothing can separate you from the love of God. 1 Peter 5, 9, believers resist the enemy by standing what? Firm in the faith, in the faith. Again, that's not your subjective faith. We talked about that yesterday, some of you. Whenever you see the faith, it's talking about the objective faith. He's talking about the scriptures. He's saying, stand firm in the word of God and you will resist the enemy. He also says that in James 4, 7. And then Matthew 4, I mean, constantly Jesus is, is overcoming the enemy through the word of God. Mark 14, 38, keep watching and praying so you won't give in to temptation for the spirit is willing, but the flesh is what? Is weak, incredibly weak. I mean, tell that. How many times do you tell that to people around you? Or do you just want to make yourself look really good and really strong? I mean, it's the best thing you do in discipleship. The best thing you do in life group is just, just admit that, hey, we're in a battle and we're incredibly weak and, and we need his strength. Trust me, the life group will go much, much more smoother that way when there's a lot of humble, humble people in the room just being really honest and vulnerable about where they're at. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, again, no temptation has overtaken you, but such is common to man. God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. Isn't that great? So you're like, this is just so much to bear. I don't think I'm gonna be, nope. That's a lie. Here's the promise. There's always a way out, but with temptation, we'll provide the way out of escape so that you'll be able to endure it. You're gonna be able to endure that testing and find that way out. God is so faithful. Another Puritan says this, any believer who has God for his friend will have the devil for his enemy. And Watson says this, prayer whips and torments Satan. I love that. It's a powerful weapon. We don't realize how powerful. I mean, Jesus said it, Paul said it, Peter said it. And Luther, when, when um, a woman came to him, said, I'm just overwhelmed with temptation. I'm overwhelmed with sin in my life. And he just said this, fall to your knees in prayer. Prayer alleviates the force of temptation. It is the best weapon against the enemy's schemes. And I think I would say the same 500 years later. It's the best weapon that we have. That's why we need this series as a church. We have a lot of great things that God has called us to do here. Um, and we want to ask for the prayer of protection. Last week's the prayer of forgiveness. The week before, the prayer of provision. This week is the prayer of protection. 
We need this. So last, I'm going to finish on this. Um, I have a few quotes, and just to help us out, I just, the, the last point here, I think is helpful. And this came towards the end of my study, and I was just studying, and I'm thinking, like, Lord, what am I missing here? I feel like I'm missing something. Oh, yeah, I forgot. I mean, what do we do if we actually do give in to temptation? <laughs> because we can pray this prayer, but the reality is we're all going to give in at some point. And what do we do when we give in in that hour of temptation? We're in a trial and we find sort of the easy way out. What happens? I was doing some reading this week and I I came across this quote I thought was brilliant. It says this, one pastor says this, sanctification is a direction you are heading. Repentance is a lifestyle you are living. Let me repeat that. Sanctification is a direction. In what direction are you going? You're going to fail. It's going to happen. I mean, just, I mean, it's not like, I, it's not that you really want to. It's just an understanding that you're going to fail at some point. So understand that sanctification, God's working on you. That's Philippians 1, 6. He's, crea- he's done a great work in you, right? Uh, and then he's going to complete that all the way to the end. So it is a direction. It is the direction in which we're heading. Repentance is a lifestyle. It's something we do all the time. I mean, when Jesus came, he said, uh, repent for the kingdom of God is here. It's not just a one-time deal. It's not just when you were, you know, you got saved at whatever age you were. Okay, I repent of my sin. I start to turn away. Look, we can't memorize enough Bible verses, say enough prayers, recite your identity as a child of God enough, develop good habits to take away the struggle, have enough devotions, solid preaching, self-discipline, accountability to eliminate failure. None of those things. Those things are great. Those things will work. They're very good things, but there's no guarantee that three weeks from now, three years from now, that you won't fall into that same sin. There's no guarantee. So the Lord gives us the one and only thing that's gonna be able to remedy that that problem, and that's the cross. It's incredibly offensive, though. It's offensive to what? First and primary, it's not the world. I mean, yeah, the world's offended by that, but what is it really, is it ultimately, what does it offend? Our pride. You see, when what happened when um, Christian, I, I recommend everybody read Pilgrim's Progress. It's an absolutely incredible book. I'm reading it to one of my kids right now. It's um, as he's going through this journey. Of course, he, you know he he has this massive burden, and then he, he comes to Christ, and then he thinks, oh, he probably thinks, hey, all right, heaven's just on the horizon. We're ready to go. Realize soon enough that he's in a massive battle. That's way, he's way over his head. And then and somebody uh, asked him, they said, well, hey, where's your wife? Where's your children? And he says it like this. He's like, his wife didn't come because she was afraid of losing the world. And the children didn't come because they were given over to the pleasures of this world. Isn't that the, always the case? It's always the reason. I mean, you, you go out and survey the campus now, you go out and survey the world now, and I mean, why do people not come to Christ? Well, it's just too hard. I love the world too much. They may never admit that, but deep inside, that's really the case. It's, what is, I mean, it's just, the pleasures are too pleasurable. It's wonderful. It's great. It's awesome. I want to stay here. I can't even imagine doing anything else. What you offer is is good, but I mean, it's probably not sustainable. And this is what Christian was saying about them. And then the other problem is he met both pagan and pope. I thought that was very interesting. Actually pretty profound when you think about it. You see, and he's saying pagan is kind of outdated. This was written in this, like what, the 1600s, the Puritan age, John Bunyan. In London. He was in prison when he wrote this story. Paganism wasn't necessarily a huge deal. I would say the same today. Pagan, it's not like if you just go up to somebody on the streets, they're like, hey, why don't you follow Christ? I'm a pagan. I doubt it. (laughs) But I'll tell you why. One of the the greatest hindrances to following Christ and clinging to the cross in your sin is the Pope. And I'm not talking about Catholicism. I'm talking about what it stands for, religion. Self-righteousness is just as evil as paganism. And the problem with all of us is, is that it pricks our pride. 
When we fail, we love, hey, look, if we could pray a prayer, the enemy can mess with us in this, that we pray this prayer and we'll have streaks in our deception, streaks of three, four, five, six, seven, eight months, maybe weeks, months, of feeling like I'm great watching everybody else around us fail, but then cling to the cross. But then what do you do when you fail as a Christian? What if you bomb it as a mom or a dad? What if you blow it as a coworker? You see, the Pope is far more evil than pagan. But what do you do? Luther says this, when Jesus said repent, he called all of us to be one of repentance. It's an ongoing turning towards God and turning away from other voices, other evils, other loves, other sins. Metanoia, which means a changing, it's an ever-changing, I love this, an ever-changing, ever-developing wisdom. It's wisdom in the moment saying, you know what, I don't want to choose that. I know where that leads. Been there, done that. I want to choose him. It's far more refreshing, far more satisfying than anything else this world has to offer. Calvin says this, that restoration does not take place in one moment or one day or one year in order that believers may reach this goal. God assigns them to the race of repentance, which they run all life long. It's an everyday battle. You're gonna continue to repent. You just get used to it. Get used to it as a parent. Get used to it as a spouse. Get used to it every, in every area of your life with your boss. You're like, I messed up. I'm not saying anything. No, you just go in and you say, you know what, I, I messed up. I'm so sorry, I screwed up. Hey, I'm gonna make this right. And we go to God first and we receive power. The second thing is not only the sanctification is a direction you're heading, repentance is a lifestyle you're living. The key to getting a long view of sanctification is understanding this, that those who can bounce back are the most successful in this life the most successful in the Christian life. And what do I mean by that? Proverbs 24, 16 says, for a righteous man may fall seven times. I mean, that's not to mean a hard number, seven is symbolic of many, 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 many times. What does it say? But they rise again. The wicked shall, fa- shall fall by calamity because they don't have any power. There's a, you're, there, there's a target on your back. You're declared righteous, but it does not mean that we're perfect. The Christian life is not about how fast you can run. It's not about how high you can climb, but it's how well you can bounce back, how well you can rise when you fall. That's what he said. I mean, it's, it's powerful. This is what God has called us to do. And I'm telling you, it, it, try it. Because the one thing that it, it comes against is, is your pride. It's weird how you think you're perfect. It's actually quite strange. Even though everything in the Bible, it says that it's so the opposite. Why do we think that? Why do we think we're owed something? It's weird how you start getting victory in the Christian life and all of a sudden you think God owes you something. And that's where the battle actually already begun a long time ago. Because somewhere along the line, you, the enemy... Well, actually, really, don't give him any credit. God allowed you to go through that and allowed you to to put faith in yourself to allow you to realize, I don't want to do that again. Just causes a lot of pain, causes distance between me and God, caused me to fall. The important thing is one pastor says, it is not what made you fall, neither the amount of times you have fallen, but that when you fall, you rise again. Luther is right. When you fail much in this life, we must live by mercy alone. Do you live by mercy alone? This is how we live. This is just, this is like what we live by. We live by mercy. We don't like mercy. (laughs) We don't like grace. Because we're not in that equation. You don't have anything to do with mercy. You don't have anything to do with grace. Only he does. That's why I love the story of Pilgrim's progress is when he's finally in this battle. I love this when he, he's like, all right, finally, help me. Like, what am I supposed to do? He meets these, these women called piety, prudence, and charity, and he shows them how to fight. And I love this little tour of the house that they take because prudence asks him, he's like, so what by, what, by what means do you find your victory against sin? 
And as he's telling this story, they're about to go on this tour, but he's telling this story. He's like, when I saw the cross, that'll do it. And he said, when I, when I saw, when I look upon the coat of righteousness, he's kind of like that Luke 15 image of the father putting this coat of righteousness on him. He's like, that'll do it. And then when I look at the scriptures, that'll do it. And when I look at heaven beyond the mountains, it's the, uh, forgot exactly what, the, what they named it, but it's, it's basically the celestial city. It's heaven. Um, and it's the, the, the house of righteousness. It's God's house. And he's saying, look at heaven. Prayer, the word, and a good outlook. It's a vision for eternity. It will give you victory in the temptation. It never changes, by the way. The weapons never change. We're always, we're always looking for another weapon. We write a book about it. It works for a little bit, but then it fails. But it always just goes back to this. And this is what I love about this. He's, he, they're actually taking him on a tour. And so they took him in the study and he, they showed him like Hebrews 11. They showed him all the victories of all these men and women who've just said yes to God and did not give in to sin, but endured to the end, just a life of perseverance. Then they went in the armor room. He said, like, look at the armor. This is actually what brings the victory of putting the armor, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, right? The sword of the spirit, the shield of faith the loin of truth, the p- shoes of peace. And then after that, then they, it stirred his faith even more. And they, they sh- he showed him Moses' rod. It's kind of like a museum. Showed him the David's sling and Samson's jawbone. Saying, do you see this God? He's so much more powerful than the enemy. Don't forget that. Actually rehearse. Like Psalm 37, actually feed on the testimonies of God. Actually just occasionally go into the museum of God and, and, and look at the, the annals of history and look at all the victories. And Hebrews 11, I mean, they were getting torn to shreds. They were getting, I mean, Hebrews was a, it was a time of I mean, just mass persecution. And Hebrews had the audacity to say, you know what? This is your key to victory. This is your key to perseverance. Look to the past and equally then look to the future because you have an incredible future that cannot be taken away from you. In order to get there, you must look at the past. You must look at what God has done and, and all the victories that he's won for so many people. This will actually help you as the great cloud of witnesses. It's a wonderful tour that we should all go on. And then he started, then after that, he left. He put on the armor and he, he left and he began to fight the enemy. The dragon, the enemy, the evil one, Satan, the accuser. You know the first thing he told them? He said, you know what? I know something about you. You say you follow Christ. You say you follow Jesus. You're saying you're, you're going, you're, you're, you're living for him. But do you know what you did in the past? You failed. What about that slew of despondency? You fell into that. He just kept going over. And if you read the stories, it's maybe about a, you know, not even a, maybe an eighth of the way in. You're going through it and you're realizing, wow, Christian is failing left and right. And guess who is taking note of all your failures. Satan. Revelation 12 says he's the accuser of the brethren. He's just, he's noting every little error that you do. And then he tells you about it. And guess what the point of that is? To actually draw you nearer to Christ? Or farther away? And not only that, but this one floored me because you know what, these things happen. I just want to put some of you at ease if these things were to happen to you into the future as you walk in a mature faith. Maybe it happened 10 years from now, I don't know. But he got past that battle. He stood, stood on the word of God, took the sword and the shield. But then he went through the valley of the shadow of death. And I thought this was probably the most interesting part to this. He says, Satan whispered blasphemous thoughts to make it sound like his own. Have you ever had that? Have you ever had shame like that in your head and you're sort of like, I can, this can't possibly be the Lord's how could I have this such grotesque, how, how could I have this blasphemous thoughts inside of my head? He was so weakened by that. He just, it was driving him further and further away. But then he re- was reminded by this one line in Psalm 23 and how fitting in the valley of the shadow of death. In the valley of the shadow of death, what? I shall not fear. Why? Because what? You're with me. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. It's impossible. But you're going to have some pretty crazy battles in your life. There's no doubt. 
In fact, it might be just as simple as somebody just distracting you from coming to church next Sunday. If you're a new person from college, you might have something to do or whatever prior obligation and just neglect the time with the Lord. And it might be just something as simple as distracting. But then eventually you'll get over that. You'll, see, you'll realize, hey, you know what? That just doesn't do it for me. I actually have a deeper conviction over the distraction. I want to be there. I want to be with the people of God. I want to actually encourage them, be encouraged. And then he'll try something else. And sometimes it'll be so evil that you'll be saying these crazy blasphemous thoughts towards God. And you're thinking, where in the world did that come from? And then we forget we're in a battle and that Satan does talk to us. And he puts these evil things in our head and they're not from us. But you know what? He talks in first person. Because you're actually saying the blasphemous thoughts. You're like, I don't want to blaspheme God. I mean, he saved my life. He's amazing and beautiful. And some of you guys who are newly walking with, with the Lord, you're like, I don't even get that. That doesn't even make sense to me. And maybe some of you veterans in the room, you're like, this is just tough. It's harder. It's harder to walk with Christ right now. You need to know that he is with you. He's your shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, right? I shall not want. So good. Well, what are we going to do now? <laughs> He's growing in wisdom. <laughs> growing in wisdom. There's just so much here. I just I don't I don't want to leave this series. I love what God has done in this church in the last eight weeks. It's been really profound and beautiful and incredible. I just want us to stay here if we can. And the Lord wants us to. He wants us to be a people of prayer. He wants us to understand the battle and, and ask what we need. And, and we need a lot, don't we? Um, maybe it is provision. Um, and maybe it is you know, the protection, and maybe it's forgiveness from sin. I don't know what it is. Uh, but maybe it's actually going back to the beginning of this, of this message where he says, pray this, our Father. Maybe it's again recognizing like Christian did in the valley of the shadow of death. He's like, man, I have a Father who actually wants to fight for me and he has not left me to battle myself. And I need to be reminded of that, that not only is he a father, but he's a father who is in heaven. He's able to do above and beyond we could ever ask or dream. He's able to release us from this temptation to give us victory in the midst of it. And Lord, we just say your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Pray that often oh, for this church, even for this summer as we pray into Toronto, Canada, or whether it's uh, Portugal or Colombia, praying, Lord, may your kingdom come. Let it bring, bring it back to your own household. Lord, I want your kingdom to permeate every bit of my mind, of my house, of my conversations, of my discipleship, of this life group. Life group leaders, do you pray your kingdom come, your will be done? I don't want my will be done. You know, I thought it was funny the other day, people were telling me, I'm like, I never thought in my wildest dream I would be putting a wedge between spouses because one spouse wants to go to Colombia and the other spouse wants to go to Portugal. Like, I'm sinning, Lord. But no, I'm not. Like, you guys gotta figure that out and be unified. And you guys gotta pray, Lord, may your will be done. Not my will. Your will. It's not my church. I mean, I said that this morning as I would go out for a run. I'm like, wait a second. You know, maybe I'll just think, oh, I gotta do this, I gotta do this, I gotta say, hold on, just... The most calming thought, at least for me, is this is not my church. I did not build this church. I might have planted this church. I don't even know what that means. I just said yes, but he did it. And he's going to see it to the end. There's a little preview to uh, Philippians, right? Philippians 1.6. He's going to see this whole thing to the very end. But we have, to, we have to occupy ourselves with these prayers. Lord, may your will be done. Let me just read this. This last line, I wanted to really close on this because I think it's, it's definitely fitting and it's got brackets. You gotta pay attention to the brackets in your Bible. It's inevitable, I know someone's gonna ask me. Well, wait a second, you didn't read the rest of verse 13. It says, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen. You know what the reality is? It wasn't in the earliest manuscripts. But it's not false. 
would you, would you say, I mean, we just say if actually even saying that, would you say that yours is the kingdom? Would you say like, this is not my earth. This isn't my church. This is your kingdom. This is your church. This is your deal, Lord. This, all, all glory goes to you. All power is in your hands. You can do all these things. And the, the early church, what they did is over time, they said, well, wait a second. You know, it just says the end of this message or the end of this teaching of Jesus of the prayer says, and, and lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. That's it. Done. Okay. That's the end of the prayer. They're like, I don't, I don't really like that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help the Lord out and kind of put this in here. And you might be thinking, well, they're adding to scripture. And I know, you know, it says in the revelation about adding to scripture, but the reality is that, you know, this is in some of your Bibles. And many don't even have brackets. I don't know, but it's truth. I think this is a, a great way to end, even though maybe it's not in the earliest manuscripts. It's a great way to end. Just say, you know what? It all goes back to you. Because the reality is when, when you give me victory in temptation, Whose glory is it? It's the Lord's. You provide all my needs to your glory. You've forgiven all my sin and you have given, gave me the power to forgive other people's sin. It's all for your glory. You protect me from evil even though I've given into that in the past and now I don't right now in the present. It's to your glory. It's a great way to end. Father, thank you so much for, for giving us this prayer again and again and again. I, I hope that us, this church, we continue to go back to this prayer over and over and over, and perhaps daily, multiple times a day. Just as a great framework, an example to how to pray all the most important things that are in your heart. Lord, I pray that, uh, that you would strengthen us, even for this prayer, verse 13. Would you, like it says, deliver us from evil, Lord. When we find ourselves in trial, or maybe we're in trial right now, I pray that we would not take an easy way out. Lord, that we would... We would trust you that you do provide the right way out and that is not through the way of sin. That is not through the way of comfort. That is not through the way of preservation of ourself. It's not through the way of loving ourselves even more. As it says in the end, those who endure, they, they, they were willing to die because they did not love themselves. They did not shrink. They were not cowardly. And Lord, I pray that you would build us into a church like that, that we would not shrink, you would not give in to the schemes of the enemy, the corruption of our flesh and the world and the world's desires, the world's temptations. Deliver us from it, protect us, shield us from it, and may we see victory in our day. In Jesus' name, amen.